Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is going to be the second of our little toolbox shows where we talk about minimum effective dose changes we can make in programming to help people get stronger. Not faster marathon times, not more flexible, not lick your elbow, but get stronger where we exert force against an external resistance. That is our goal. There are obviously minimum effective dose changes that can be made for all those things as well. But we don't care about those because they're not virtuous like this is. It's true. So where our goal, I think it's actually important to say it, and that's why I did. Our goal is always to increase some people's ability to exert force, to become stronger. In the last show, we talked about what are some of the first things you can do when you need to apply more stress to the trainee. Go listen to that show, MED Toolbox number one. Here we're going to do the toolbox number two, which is what if they can't recover from their work? So let's talk about first, how would you know that the guy or gal, the trainee, is having difficulty recovering? Really difficult to know. It is. They're not hitting their reps. Yeah, so they're not hitting their reps. So the first thing we do is we ask the three questions. Always ask the three questions. Well, first off, you don't ask the three questions, though, unless you're not hitting reps. Right. So the first thing that occurs is, so we know if you can hit your reps, your prescribed reps, if over the course of time, stress is increasing, because it has to over time, Mm -hmm. and you're hitting your weights, you know, if that's a volume day on Monday and an intensity day on Friday, per se, and you're able to hit it, then you're recovering enough. It's okay. Now, the question is, as soon as you start to miss reps, and not usually just for one workout, but often for a couple workouts in a row, then the three questions apply. And what those are, what? are you resting enough both between sets and between sessions? Yep. Are you eating enough food? The other one is, are you sleeping? Enough? Are you uh, sleeping enough? Right. And, and are you making small enough jumps? And, Actually, we're, we screwed that up. So are you, are you second. recovering in between sets and between the sessions that would include your sleep? Are you eating enough? Are the weight jumps appropriate? And Correct. those three questions are predicated on the idea that we are in LP and that the volume or that the sets and reps are fixed. And that the only thing that goes up is the intensity. And if the answer to all those things is yes, then you've done what you can do to facilitate the recovery. You're programming properly because the sets and reps are fixed and the weight jumps are appropriate. We're at the end of LP. So we've used up all of the good that's in LP for us at that point. If you're resting and you're eating and you're taking sufficiently small weight jumps at the end of LP and you still can't recover, then LP is no longer suitable for you. Works for everyone until it doesn't work. And so we're at the point where it doesn't work. So now what do we do? In the last show we did about this, we talked about needing more stress, which is absolutely going to be the case for the bench press, probably at the end of LP. The recovery thing, I think, becomes a more universal problem later in intermediate programming, right? So let's talk about somebody who, let's say, is on HLM. HLM bothers me, by the way, because there's that HLN network or whatever that there's like a table oh, network sorry, with like Dr. Drew it? on there and like talk shows. HLN I like Dr. Drew, though. I like Dr. Drew, but, but I don't like his talk show. One. I don't even like his podcast. Oh, um, I've never seen his talk show. Yeah, I just like Loveline. I grew up on Loveline. Oh, man. So Corolla, and they taught me everything that my parents didn't. <laughs> Go to lovelinetapes.com and you can download oh, I mean, all and of the think old about, shows. And then think about them talking about those issues in the late 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't talk about stuff like that 20 years ago, but they did. Yeah. Corolla's so good. So HLM. Yeah, HLM or uh, Texas Method. You know, but the thing is, we've got like a one-week periodization program, right? You can call it whatever you want. So you've got some intensity and you have some volume, but it's starting to not work. So at the end of LP, the only thing we're changing is intensity. At the end of intermediate programming, we're changing intensity and we're changing volume. And we've changed sets and reps. So we've changed everything, but we're still not recovering. Frequency is the same, right? And volume is waving and intensity is waving. Right. So we're, on a, for, we're talking about a guy on a three-day-a-week program at this point. Yeah, like a Texas method or a heavy light medium. And right. by the way, I think I sort of mentioned this in a previous podcast, like you want to get your diagnostic foot in the lexicon. Mm. There is a major, major difference in these forms of recovery. One is, I don't know a better word to use but it's already being used in lexicon. One is what I would call active recovery. Mm-hmm. Active recovery is not, you know, when you see Rich Froning, he say, oh, I did a 5,000 meter active recovery row today. That's not active recovery. Active recovery is food and sleep. 
is actively eating it's, and actively it's laying actively on your ass. eating and actively sleeping. So it's the things that you make sure that you're doing in order to recover, right? And yeah, you know, we could probably do an entire show just on those sorts of things, like how to make sure that you're not just eating enough, not an eating through the sticking points thing, but an eating correctly in order to recover and increase performance without adding increased body fat. That's an important topic. And I think sleep is drastically underlooked. It's not people don't take it into the equation of sleep is incredibly important, like quality sleep. So for just a second, let me get on my high horse for a second. Look, if you're especially if you're a male who weighs over 210 pounds somewhere in that ballpark, you need to go get a sleep study and see if you need a CPAP. If you're married <laughs> and your wife tells you that you're snoring or if you're a female and your husband tells you that you are snoring and or choking and waking up in the middle of the night, you need to go get mm. a CPAP. I got a CPAP years ago. It took me a, several years to get it fitted right and get the right to really get used to it. And in the past 18 months, I have a CPAP that I wear. I can't even take a nap anymore without a CPAP. The quality of sleep in my naps are so much better. I'm telling you, I get it. There's some embarrassment. But like when you lift for years, whether you're overweight or not, if you lift for years, your neck is made up full of muscle and the, that muscle in your neck expands, it thickens and it closes off your airway. Your yeah. glottis basically closes and your tongue relaxes and you'll choke all night long and you cannot get good sleep. So you have to make sure you're getting good sleep. Second, you should be making sure that you're sleeping enough time every night. Like you should be sleeping at least seven hours every single night. Like seven hours is a big deal. Now, I frequently don't get seven hours in a night. But you know what I do is I take a nap almost every day. And I don't take a very long nap. I take a half hour nap, put that CPAP in, knock out, wait, and I don't set an alarm. I wake up and I feel great. You're just resetting yourself. Like sleep is a big deal. So that active recovery piece of making sure that you're getting enough protein, enough carbohydrates to fuel your training. If you're underweight and need to gain weight, you've got to, you can add some additional fat to make sure you get the calories there. If you're not, if you're like me, you don't need the fat, you need the protein and the carbs primarily and really good sleep. So those are the active recovery. So then the question is, what does recovery look like that isn't that? And we talked about this earlier. It's actually just the reduction of stress, right? right? It's figuring out recovery becomes how do I figure out how to reduce stress if I'm not hitting my reps. Yeah. So if you're in that situation and you're not hitting your five on your heavy day or you're not hitting your five fives on your volume day or your light day, whatever you want to call it, what do you do? Well, the first thing we might do is take some weight off the bar. That would help us recover. It would. Are we going to get stronger taking weight off the bar? It wouldn't. We won't. I mean, we're going to take weight off the bar from four sessions. Sure. Or for, for even particular sessions. sets from correct. time to time. But as a general rule, we're not going to get stronger on average, week in, week out, taking weight off the bar. So that's not something I really want to do. Remember, too, you can look at this like we do for everything. You can look at it from this sort of big bird's eye macro view. And I would think about that as sort of weekly programming changes, like what the program looks like. Like if I'm not able to recover from the program week after week, something has to change about the program. And that's really right. what you're starting to point at. As I get in tighter and tighter and tighter and more on the ground and less in the air, I have scenarios where I have a sinus infection or I got the flu or I had work stress or family stress. I didn't sleep well the night before. And for individual sessions, if that is the case, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about LP. For LP, man, you just, you just try to grind through the weight, right? That's what you do. You don't make really any modifications or very few modifications to LP programming. But as you get into this intermediate-based programming, you certainly can make a modification to a workout to decrease the stress of a workout, to still get some mm -hmm. work in. And you can decrease that stress by reducing the amount of weight on the bar or the amount of volume that you do. Now, I have to put an asterisk there. You said that about having the, being sick or whatever in LP. Now, I'll say this. If you've had a fever or you've been out more than 12 days, we're going to back off a little bit and work back up. Yeah, I, I would out. even say seven, although it doesn't matter. I mean, yep. like, you know, if somebody misses an entire seven days, I'm going to make a change. And yes, I'm not actually talking about sick, sick. Right. I'm well, talking I, about I wanna... sick enough to train. Yeah, if you're running 102 degree fever, you don't train. Yeah, so here's the deal. I, I think we have to be practical here because people are listening and don't know. If you've had a fever 
you need to back off one session or two session and repeat a few sessions and then and then keep on trucking. Correct. When you run a fever, you're killing muscle fibers and all kinds of stuff. Like you're sick. For my older guys, if you've missed seven to 10 days, I'll have them repeat their last session in general. If they've missed more than that, I will also back them up a few sessions and have them repeat those sessions. That's how we deal with those things in LP. Yep. But for this guy that's this intermediate, you know, we don't want to take weight off of the bar as a general rule. Like we don't, we're not going to say, okay, he's having trouble recovering. We're just going to unload this stuff and he's just not going to move as much weight. Sure. We wouldn't do that because we just don't get stronger by moving less weight. Sure. Would we reduce the volume? Well, you actually run into a similar problem. I mean, the answer is, sure, you could reduce the volume, and that is a way to reduce stress. But if, as we talked about in Toolbox episode number one, if we are using both volume and intensity as the primary drivers of stress, then I think that you still want to keep pushing volume and keep pushing intensity. So now you're really in this conundrum, right? Can you decrease volume? Sure. But there are ways to decrease volume that make it so that it is not as stressful on your body. For example, like if I'm doing five sets of five, that's 25 reps. Could I do seven sets of four? Yeah. Right. I could do more sets and less reps. I could do eight sets of three. Eight sets of three is 24. But, right. It, but that's a similar that, volume. It's a less stressful. In my experience, it's a less stressful way to do it. You think, no, you rather do eight sets of three or five sets of five at the same weight. Sure. It's not clear to me, Matt. It really isn't. Really? I mean, yeah, it's not. Like, now five sets of three versus three sets of five? Okay, no question. Eight sets okay. of three? You've got to unrack, get tight against that thing, walk it in, walk it out. Like, time under tension total for eight sets of three is much higher than five fives. No, disagree. It sucks. You're in Tulsa. I'd punch you in the face. <laughs> it sucks. It sucks. Oh, man. Uh, okay. And, well, and this is maybe why some of it's individual, you know? I know one of the things we'll do is, okay, let's go to a piece that we'll agree on first. Well, hang one on. The, let me say this. Okay. There's no question that when you're doing a heavy five fives, three fives, whatever fives, it's the last two reps. You don't care. The first three reps are fine. That's why I'm just doing more of those. Well, I get it. I get it. But, you know, for me, I have trouble keeping the thoracic extension and all that stuff. Man, yeah, I don't want to get set up a you. whole We're bunch. We're talking about the general bell curve. We're not talking about the far yeah, left right. end of you're the... Right. <laughs> The far left end of the athletic spectrum over here, Hammer. Right, you're right. You're so right. it's fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, that's trying to answer the question of how do we reduce stress mm -hmm. so that you can recover? Right. While, I mean, this is the theology of it all, <laughs> is while increasing stress over the course of time. How do you increase stress over the course of time? Yeah. So while okay. decreasing stress in order to recover, right? Like this is really difficult. I mean, it's difficult. It's because it's if you reduce stress over time, you get weaker. Right. So stress has to keep going up. So let's say how my, do we make stress keep going up while making stress go down so that I can recover? So let's say my opinion out of it and your opinion out of it. Okay. 400 pounds, five sets of five, it's 25 reps. 400 pounds, eight sets of three, 24 reps. Pretty much right. the same. Like, is it actually less stress in terms of recovering today? So, and same way, same weight way. X, five sure. by five and eight by three. Okay. Like, That's is fair. it actually different? magnitudes of stress i mean we know there's a one rep difference here sure but is there a difference in stress that exceeds that of the one rep difference in terms of training on monday and then coming back sure on wednesday sure and being recovered i don't sure. think so i think they both beat the client up equally okay that's fair close enough to not argue about that's during the, the session sure the eight triples yeah. is probably easier than the five fives. Absolutely. So before we make a change to frequency, which I know we'll get there on mm -hmm. this episode, because that's, that's where we have to go, where you have to, there are things that you can do, I think, with back offsets in order to still decrease the amount that the body feels beat up. So I could still get a similar increase in tonnage by hitting a top set on Monday, one set of five. Right. And more back off sets of five or maybe the same number of sets for six and backed off weight where I'm doing that calculation. Again, if the volume day, if the stress that matters is the volume or the tonnage or some combination thereof, then I can play that game where I'm still making sure that I'm getting my volume in and make it so that it is not such a heavy stressor event. And I can do that with back off sets if I need mm -hmm. to. I can do it with reducing the number of reps per set and increasing the sets. 
For some people who are probably more sort of slow twitch, oxidative sort of people, they might decrease the number of sets and increase the number of reps. They might be able to hit three sets of seven just as easy as they can hit sets of five, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's going to depend on the person, right? We know that Friday, the intensity has to continue to increase. Now, one way that we can decrease stress on Friday is to continue to decrease the volume on Friday while making sure that the bar weight continues to go up. So instead of hitting one set of five, I could certainly hit two sets of three, which is actually more stress and not as hard. I can definitely hit one set of three. Right. I can hit one set of three and a back off set of three or a back off set of five. I can hit a double. I can hit three doubles. So there are things I can do to make sure if the main driver of stress on Friday is intensity, there are things I can do to make sure the intensity goes up and I can keep peeling volume off on Friday. And then likewise, which I think is really what we're getting at, is on Monday, you can do the same thing. You can keep the volume high and peel off some intensity if you need to and keep driving that up and making sure that the tonnage number continues to go up. But what's the best option for decreasing stress that you and I both do? Well, for the intermediate who's on like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday plan or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday plan, just move them to a four-day split and mm -hmm. give them one extra day Holla, between, between bouts. Huge difference. Huge difference. These other things that you're talking about are helpful and they're going to be arrows in our quiver, but man, pound for pound, <laughs> you know, agreed. Four day splits, the best single thing that you can that do. That is There's the best no question that you could do. Because it gives you so much freedom to manipulate stress. And here's why because you're going from three major lifts per day and sometimes four mm -hmm. to two major lifts per day. So even though the frequency in this sort of in the air macro view goes from three workouts a week to four workouts a week, the total work should be the same and just divided up over four days instead of over three days, which makes each individual session less stressful and gives you more time to recover muscle groups or movements, movements are how we think it. So I have more time to recover between squat events than I did. So instead of having a squat on Monday, one day rest, squat on Wednesday, one day rest, squat on Friday, I can squat on Monday. I can rest Tuesday and Wednesday and then squat again on Thursday and then rest Friday and Saturday and Sunday and squat on Monday again. Right. And now I have a volume day on Monday, an intensity day on Thursday. There's almost nothing else to say. I think this episode's over. Where else can you manipulate stress, though? The other advantage you get with the four-day split is then you can play with stress with the extra slots, with the accessory movements, right? So because right. you move to a four-day split where you're moving to a sort of an upper-lower split of squats and deadlifts on one day or on two of those days and press and bench press on the other, now I can actually manipulate stress with the accessory movements. So on that lower body day, I could potentially do nothing. I could just squat and deadlift. I could squat and deadlift and add another movement like a leg press or a glute hammer raise, or maybe I'm just pushing a heavy prowler or something like that, or not. And if I have to reduce stress, it's easy to pull those accessory pieces out in order to reduce stress and continue with the main lifts. The main lifts are really the thing that matters when you go to a four-day split. And the accessory movements, those slots are there to add and reduce stress as needed. And on upper body day, it's even easier. On upper body day, I'm going to do that bench in the press. I'm going to do some sort of back movement, which is going to be like a chin up or a pull down or a row. And I'm usually going to do some sort of arm work at that point and biceps and triceps, biceps or triceps or biceps and triceps. And on days that I'm feeling beat up, on weeks that I need recovery, I can just keep the first two movements in and drop mm -hmm. the accessory stuff. And I can very much address the stress problem there by pulling some of that stress away and allow myself that extra recovery, it just gives you the freedom to do that. The problem is when you are only doing the barbell movements in a three-day split, in a Monday, Wednesday, Friday split, what do you pull? Yeah. You're going to lose a movement, right? The four-day split gives the person more time to recover, and it's most bang for your buck for sure uh, when the intermediate starts to falter. So that's awesome. We love it for that. But it also sets you up to use those other arrows that are in your quiver that we talked about. It gives you chances to put way more slots in. You have to increase the rest time between bouts so that we can actually do more tonnage later also. So it also sets you up for success two years from now. That's right. Because you can't do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You can't do three a week. 
uh, and just continue to approach your genetic potential for I mean, you, you right. can't do it forever. Post LP, the second someone asks to move to four day split or wants to move to four day, they're going. Okay. So that's interesting. So how about this? Why don't we just move them to a four day split? I do a lot of times right out of LP. Well, I mean, because I minimum effective dose them from LP to a Texas method style, mm-hmm. right? Or an HLM style. And I think that if you made the jump right from LP to a four day Texas method split, you're changing more than the minimum effective dose. And I would rather just change the minimum effective dose. And so, but once I get to a program that looks like Texas, that is like five sets of five, or it's a, a clear volume day one day and a clear intensity day the other day, I know you've talked about on a three day Texas method or heavy light medium sort of split, you'll often just drop that squat on the Wednesday. Mm. I don't, except I do, but when I do it, I go to a four-day split. <laughs> I so don't what I never I do. do is, I know, so to talk out both sides of my mouth, I never have somebody do three days a week and only squat twice. So here, here's, th- At least it's very, 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 very. So rare. here's my rationale. When I drop the squat, what I'm essentially doing is I'm putting their squat on a four-day split, but everything else is three times a week. Yes, you are. That's exactly what you're doing. Which, yeah. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. I yeah. just... I don't just drop the Wednesday out of hand, right? I'm like, mm. so here's why I don't put a guy straight into four-day split when he comes out of LP. You have to go to the gym another day. Sure, unless the gym is in your garage. Even then, which you, yeah, you got to get your stuff out. You got to, sure. uh, 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 you know, I don't want to do that until we need to. I really yeah. don't. Well, it's interesting after having coached you and your wife for years and also coached me for years, <laughs> I have noticed that you guys tend to like doing three day a week training. Training at the Hambrick house is an event. <laughs> it is. It lasts a long time. You're, I mean, man, your wife trains clients all day right. and she takes a lot of rest periods between sets. You guys make four pots of coffee. It's sort of a social event and everybody's working hard. I don't want to make it sound like you're not working hard, but I mean, it's like a, you guys will often go out there to the garage and you're out there for like three and a half hours. And it's not because the workout has to take that long. It's because you're training four other people at the same time and you're having conversations and you're responding to online great books, emails, and you're just, and then when it's time to go, you focus and go. For me, I would much rather spend less time in the gym per session right? with more sessions. So I've talked about this. I would not, as a matter of fact, I don't program this for any of my clients, but I'm currently training six days a week. Right. And I'm never in the gym more than 45 minutes. And it's because I need it less for the performance aspect and more so for the sanity aspect. I need to train for my own sanity in a period of my life where everything is stressful, you know, with talking about my dad as of now is still alive and, and, uh, but watch my dad die and just in the business, um, stresses and whatnot, I need to get out there and train. It's good for me. Right. And when I have a day that I don't train, I feel like I've, I'm missing something. And so I, I know I can't get out there like a CrossFitter and compete every day you know, hashtag compete every, I don't do that. Right. Right. But I get out there and hit a one good lift and, um, and some accessory movements and a little bit of conditioning. I feel good. And so the reason I, I mentioned those things is because whether we would like to admit it or not, every single coach that I have ever worked with will use their own personal bias to program their clients. If you would rather do a three day split as a coach, I'll guarantee you, you have more of your clients doing three days a week. And if you would rather put somebody on a four-day split because you enjoy four-day split, you will have more of your clients doing that as well. So I would always rather have my clients on a four-day. Most of mine are on (laughs) four-day. It's easier to program. You get wiggle room in there. That's right. It's just just what you got to do. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. When you're having trouble, legit trouble, you answered your three questions and you're having legit trouble recovering. That's what you do. So when I drop that midweek on the LP, I'm actually just putting the squat on a four day split. split. The first change I make to frequency out of LP is putting deadlift on a four day split. And then usually it's at the same time. When I go to a light day Wednesday for the squat, I usually move the deadlift to a a barbell row on Wednesday. And so we talk all the time, like, man, it doesn't matter if you want to power clean and you're 40 years old, do it, man. I'm, it's fine. Right. You know, we've had this talk with Sully and Sully makes good points for what power cleans do for you from a mental standpoint. My argument with the power clean is the power clean does not drive a strength increase. It does not drive a strength increase. Now, is it for the terms of this podcast, a reduction in stress compared to the deadlift? Absolutely. 
It absolutely is a reduction of stress. No, it is. So if you're 55 years old and you're jumping real hard, yeah. that's probably not a type of stress that you want to have. But for a guy like me and even a guy like you, if my deadlift workout for the day was going to be 500 pounds for two sets of five, that was my medium day or even, you know, or maybe it's 405 for three sets of five or something. It's my light day. Mm -hmm. And I replace that and I power clean. What am I going to power clean for sets training? I'm going to power clean 205, 225. Right. Like that's not like, yes, the jumping portion of that and the sort of the stomping on the ground is kind of stressful, but the weight is so light, it doesn't drive the stress increase. So it's a reduction in stress. But you know what else is a reduction in stress? Not doing it. A 275 pound barbell row. Right. Yeah. Which is still stressful. And so the point here is this, the sort of Cliff Notes version of this is first, from a recovery standpoint, you make sure you're doing those active recovery things, which are not 5,000 meter rows. They are eating and sleeping. Are you eating right? Are you sleeping? Are you taking enough rest between sets? Are you taking enough rest between sessions? Because we defined recovery as the absence of stress, not something that you actively do, right? That's right. So that's why there's the two things, right? So that first piece is the thing that you actively do. And then the second question is, how do you reduce stress? And we reduce stress often by changing the frequency so that we can continue to drive the intensity up on the intensity day so that we can continue to drive the volume up on the volume day. And we change the frequency in order to give us enough recovery or the absence of stress mm -hmm. in order to recover between those time periods. And then here's the fun part with the slots, talking about the accessory. You talked about how it's easier to program on that four day split. And it absolutely is because you always know two days a week, I'm going to squat and deadlift. And two days a week, I'm going to bench press and press. And what changes is what comes after those things. Right. And let's take upper body days. If I start to have too much stress, I need to reduce stress. The first place I'm going to reduce that stress is in the accessory movements. I'm going to row a little less. I'm going to chin a little less. I'm going to barbell curl, tricep extension, LTEs, like things like that. I'm going to do those less. And if I need more stress, I can often add them there as well. So I can increase the volume or the weight or the tonnage of those accessory movements. If I want to get more stress, on the barbell movements on those days, I can do that and I just reduce the stress on the accessory movements those days and maybe do no accessories at all. It yeah. works beautifully. You know, when I drop out that midweek squat at the end of LP, I end up with eight slots a week. That's right. We got a four day split, eight slots a week. You can get up to 16 or even 20 slots in a sure. four day split if you got some crazy person and needs That's it. That's right. You know, it's so good. I mean, I don't think we need to say more about that. No, um, it's perfect. But think about recovery that way. I think that's the way to think about recovery. The first thing I do is do the active piece, the sleep and the food. We've got to stop saying that. Recovery well, what's the better word the, for it? Just recover. Protect the time that you need to recover. Yeah, but it's what I'm saying is, though, it's different between the sleep and the food are, are active things I can do and add. Just make sure you're sleeping and eating, you know, because okay, that's fine. Because everybody but, says and then the other piece and they mean of recovery. 5,000 meters. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Crazy. No, I get it. Yeah, there needs to be a better term. But the point I'm making there is the first thing you're doing is you're adding sleep and food. It's right. something I'm adding to the week. Yeah, you need I'm to adding sleep and I'm adding food. And the second way to look at recovery is I'm reducing stress. It's the absence of stress. And so I make sure I do number one first, add sleep, add food. And then I make sure that I still cannot recover, that I start to decrease stress or reduce stress. The best way we believe to do that is with that frequency change. Another word about stress. You and I and Charity and Rachel, we all did that uh, big five personality, you know, yep. profile thing not too long. Yep. Well, about a year ago, probably. Yep. And uh, my agreeableness score is precisely zero. Yep. My politeness score is four. This is out of 100 where 100 would be the most polite, agreeable yep. person you ever met. You're the life. least agreeable, least polite person we've ever met. That's right. And the high uh, conscientiousness. High conscientiousness and somewhat, uh, high industriousness. I have bitten my fingernails like a crazy squirrel for 44 years. Yeah. You're talking literal. You literally chew your fingernails. Yes. Yeah. Sold my business. I just noticed the other day I had to file my fingernails. I have never have filed my fingernails one time. Fingernails now. I have never filed my fingernails one time in my entire life. And I just noticed crazy. I needed to. Like the interacting with people <laughs> that I had sure. to do in school and the interacting with people I had to do as, in course of that business was making me eat parts of my body. <laughs> yeah, literally. 
And now the people that you yes. interact with on a daily basis are people who want to be part of online great books or who want to be part of Barbara Logic. Yeah. We're all part of the same tribe. You yeah, know? that's right. It's fine. Yeah, far less and stressful. It's far less stressful. I'm still having, you know, some arthritis problem, hip hurts, it's nasty, whatever. Sure. But overall, the stress in my life is reduced a great yeah, deal. Yeah, that's the next goal for me as your coach is to figure out how to get you healthy, joints healthy. I think you're in a really healthy mental place right now. You know, you're fixing your diet and cleaning that thing back up and not that great though. No, no. Hey, I'm really. down five and a half inches since January 1st on my waist. No, I, I've been getting fluffy since I don't have that structure of going to the office and like, you know, not I having a refrigerator it. and all that. I've been getting a little bit fluffy, but I don't. I just got to get on a schedule. Man, I don't care. I don't even care. Well, like I'm not going to get obese. I'm not going to go to like 290. Yeah, train hard enough to not. Yeah, sure. it's fine. I don't care. Yeah. So we'll get your joints healthy and we'll do that in a similar sort of manner. I'm going to figure out the things that are stressful to your joints and stressful like that hurt. And we're going to start to pull those things away and add the things in that don't hurt and allow some of that inflammation to dissipate. And I don't want to jinx it all, but, you know, this ultimately is going to culminate in a, in a hip replacement, you know, at some point. My mom's had one. I mean, it's just in the cards for me. It's in the cards for you. It's just like, you know, how long can we go without doing that? How weird would it be if you got a hip replacement before I got a hip replacement? Uh, Let's just go together. Let's go on the same day and see if the, that Tulsa that's doctor is good. That's see if we get for a one. discount. Right. Yeah, or not a two for one, but like get us a 20% discount if we're both laying well, on the table. No, we need buy two, get one free because we'll have both of yours done bilateral and then I'll have right. one and then we'll just. And then yours is the we'll free one? Split the tab. Is that how no, we'll works? just split the tab. I'll do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's another Barbell Logic podcast. That's our little toolbox episode number two. Hopefully that's useful. Trying to make it as clear cut as we can, although these things sort of get fuzzy. We were talking about the stress recovery adaptation cycle in a couple episodes ago, and, and we were talking about how the stress recovery adaptation model becomes a little fuzzier for us when we become an intermediate. You know, where is the stress? Where is the recovery piece? We know how to find the adaptation. We do that when we test our PRs and do our heavy fives, but it's not clear to us where those other pieces are taking place. So we have to draw a line in the sand. In the case of the intermediate, we say, our stressors occur and our recovery occur over a five to seven day period. And then we start trying to figure out how we can sneak in some more work, which we talked about in our toolbox episode number one. And then we talk about how can we sneak in some more chances to recover. And that's what we talk about here. And we do that primarily through the introduction of the four day split. So hopefully that clears it all up for you. Then leave us a five star review. Go to barbelllogic.com and sign up for the Friday Fives newsletter. That is awfully good. And then see some of the content that you want to pick up in these other venues. So yeah. I like the newsletter thing, actually. Well, what else, man? I think that's it. That's it. All yeah. right. We'll see you guys and talk to you in a few days. Thank you. Thank you.